From the Gert Boyle studio, it's OPB Politics Now for Friday, September 6th. How Oregonians will vote in this year's presidential election isn't much of a mystery. But the battles for the state's three swingiest congressional districts are seeing increased attention from both sides. That's one reason why the Oregon Republican Party has seemed very interested lately in a minute fraction of the state's electorate. The Oregon GOP has been pushing for almost two months now to get candidates nominated by the tiny Libertarian Party of Oregon off the ballot. It's now even asking the state's Department of Justice to weigh in. And as we'll talk about, the stakes for November could be pretty high, particularly for one congressional race. I'm OPB politics reporter Dirk Vanderhart, and I'm joined today by a special guest, Julia Shumway, deputy editor and lead political reporter at the Oregon Capital Chronicle, has been covering this spat very closely. She's going to help walk us through it. Julia, welcome to Politics Now. Happy to be here. So... Let's start by laying out the players here, I guess. On one side, we have obviously the Oregon Republican Party. It is the second largest political party in the state. It has more than you know 722,000 registered members, a pretty weighty big player in state politics. And then there is the Libertarian Party of Oregon, which is, I, I would not say, a big player in state politics. Not at all. It's got just less than 20,000 voters. For context, Oregon as a whole has more than 3 million total. Libertarians don't win elections, but they can be counted on to get a few hundred or a few thousand votes when they're on the ballot. And when you've got congressional races decided by 6,000, 7,000, 8,000 votes, that can make a difference. And, you know, libertarians obviously value small government. Um, that is often a value shared by Republicans. And so the conventional wisdom, not always accurate in every case, but is that if there is a libertarian candidate on the ballot, that person is going to be a bit more attractive to voters who might otherwise vote Republican if, you know, there was not a libertarian candidate on the ballot. And that is one of the reasons we are talking about uh, this today. You know, these two parties have had tensions for years. In fact, the GOP has even tried in vain before to get libertarians off the ballot back in 2020. But, but this really has seemed to ramp up this year. You reported in July about actually worries by members of the Libertarian Party that Republican operatives were even going to sort of try to sabotage their party's nominating convention. Can you walk us through that? What were the worries that you were hearing? Yeah, this was one of the more fascinating rumors I've heard in the years I've been covering politics. Um, Matt Rao, who's the, the chairman of the Libertarian Party, said he had heard from a Republican friend of his that Republican operatives were organizing to get some number of Republican voters to temporarily re-register as libertarians, hop on buses or carpool out to Morrow, this tiny town in Sherman County where libertarians were holding their convention. Once there, those Republicans in disguise would outnumber the real libertarians and nominate straw candidates who would then withdraw at the last minute to make sure no actual libertarians were on the ballot. It is worth noting that every Republican I talked to flat, flat out denied any knowledge of this and that it didn't end up happening. In fact, the, the Libertarian Convention itself couldn't start because Libertarians didn't have a quorum. If I'm right, didn't you quote a Republican um, uh, that said, you know, I've heard something like that, but I'm certainly not part of it. I mean, didn't you get some sense that there was at least something in the air among Republicans on that? Or, or am I misremembering your story? No, that that's right. Um, that was uh, Kevin Hoare. He's running the campaign of Monique de Spain, the Republican candidate for Oregon's fourth congressional district. And I'd heard through libertarians that he was the mastermind behind all of this. He denied being the mastermind, but he definitely said, yeah, I've, I've heard some stuff about that. There might be people trying to do this. So, but as you said, this did not come to pass. Republicans didn't flood in. In fact, as we'll probably talk about, they didn't even have a quorum to, to do this whole nominating convention. But it did soon become clear that the, the Oregon Republican Party was going to be making an effort to get libertarians off the ballot to sort of sabotage things, if you want to call it that, that way. And, and that it would do so in part by relying on this very arcane, you know, detailed, nuanced, old dispute in Oregon libertarian politics that goes back more than a decade. I'm going to ask you to try to explain this rift. Uh, not the easiest task, but, but lay it out for folks. 
Yeah, this this is a really complicated backstory of really half the half the party's Wikipedia page is dedicated to this controversy. <laughs> um, but in short, there's there were two different factions of the party that elected their own leaders in separate meetings in 2011. One of those factions and its new leader decided to adopt new bylaws. They made some big changes, including that they'd switch from regularly having nominating conventions that only people who paid dues to the party could participate in to having party elections be held through mail ballots or um or online voting that would allow any registered libertarian voter to participate whether or not they were paying dues. The other faction says those bylaws are invalid and that any candidates who are nominated by the faction that's now in power aren't eligible. And so for the past 13 years, there have been complaints to election officials, appeals to the national party, appeals that, appeals to various levels of the Oregon courts. Most of the people who are involved in this dispute are long gone, and state election officials and the courts have generally said that the party just needs to figure out its own issues. Right. I mean, it, it gets so confused because uh, the National Party at one point said, well, whoever the Oregon Secretary of State recognizes gets to to be the ones that nominate folks. And then it walked that back and said, we actually think the, you know, one set of these 2011 bylaws is the wrong one. Uh, uh, pr probably too deep to get into and maybe besides the point. But the basic point is we have two factions of the Libertarian Party. Both of them claim to have party bylaws that are valid. The Oregon Secretary of State, as you said, recognizes only one of those factions. I mean, how did they pick sides here? What was what was the mechanism they ch they used to choose one over the other? And because that is, is a very important sort of lingering factor here. So essentially, back in 2011, the new newly elected leader of one faction got to the secretary of state's office first said we're the libertarian party here are our bylaws and then when the other faction showed up and said we're the libertarian party um the secretary of state said well we, we already have a libertarian party where we you only get one party chair mm. and it's just continued that way for the past 13 years and again most of these people aren't really there the the two factions there aren't many people in the faction that lost. There's really, really a, a, just a couple people who are still very invested in this fight. A bunch more people who have joined the Libertarian Party since then um, know what the Libertarian Party is now. And they're the they're the group operating under these bylaws adopted in 2011 that put forth all of these candidates a couple of months ago. Yeah, and let's talk about that. So that they meet... Um... <sighs> There's a bit of a convoluted process, but ultimately the Libertarian Party comes up with nominees. Who are the nominees? What you know? What races are they playing in this year? Um, what do we know about the folks they've put forward? So they've got candidates running in four state legislative races, all of which are pretty solidly Democratic or Republican. They're not races where anyone is really concerned about Libertarians having much of an impact. They've also got a nominee for president, um, someone and someone running against Congresswoman Suzanne Bonamici in the first congressional district. That one's also pretty safe. No one's too worried about the libertarian candidate there. But the two really notable ones are the fourth and fifth congressional districts, which are two of Oregon's really competitive races. They've got Sonia Feintech. She's a former Republican who was really active in anti-vaccine and anti-lockdown movements during COVID. She's running in the 5th District. And Dan Balin, he's an Arizona transplant who worked in tribal medicine. He's running in the 4th. Yeah, I mean, the, these two races specifically uh, seem key to the Republican interest in whether or not the Libertarian Party is operating with the right bylaws, right? It, um, there are three pretty high-profile congressional races in the 4th, 5th, and 6th this year. Republicans think they have a shot at all of those. And in the 5th, you know, all signs point to this being a toss-up race with Lori chavez Dreamer defending her seat as a Republican. So this gets to the heart of the Republican Republican worry here that libertarian candidates on the ballot are going to hurt their chances because they'll siphon off some amount of votes that could be really, really important. Um, uh, you know, what what do the Republicans say about that when you ask them about their motives here? Are they are they upfront about the fact that they're trying to eliminate spoiler candidates? 
They're they're not. So they've really phrased this as they're just trying to make sure that everyone follows election laws, that it's in in every Oregonian's best interest that election laws are followed. They think the Libertarian Party is breaking election laws, and that's why that's why they're fighting this. But if you look at some recent history, in, in 2020, Joe Ray Perkins, who was the Republican nominee for Senate, actually sued to remove her libertarian opponent from the ballot, saying that she would be uniquely damaged by him being there and him taking votes away from her. So we know there is there is precedent. And even though Republicans don't really want to say it this time around, they don't want libertarians on the ballot because they don't want libertarians taking votes they think are theirs. Well, and, and some of these folks, I think, are being more upfront about it. I listened recently to an interview with Richard Burke. He's a member of the Libertarian Party, but he is participating in this challenge. He, he is one of the folks that thinks uh, the 2011 bylaws are illegal and he doesn't want them on the books. He's pretty uh, upfront that he thinks Sonia Feintesh, who you mentioned in the, the 5th mm -hmm. Congressional District, has something out for Lori Chavez de Reamer and is really only running just to be purely a spoiler and try to get her to lose because of some personal vendetta. Um, I, I spoke with Tyler Smith, who's the attorney for the GOP, uh, who, who has filed the challenge on, on the GOP's behalf. And you know, he, he was a little bit more circumspect. He said, well, you know, on balance, maybe they take more from Republicans, but libertarians don't identify with one party or the other in any great respect. For instance, you know, libertarians might agree with Measure 110, which decriminalized drug possession here. Uh, a lot of Democrats agreed with that. So maybe they agree mm -hmm. more on something like that, whereas uh, maybe conservatives align with libertarians. So yeah, he's saying it's a little more muddled than just one thing, but I think it's a little hard to see them taking so uh, keen an interest in libertarian politics if, if they aren't worried about their own chances. Um, so, you know, the, the GOP first asked the Secretary of State's office to what they would say is follow the law, pull the libertarian candidates from the ballot. The Secretary of State declined to do that in line with some of their, their past decisions. So now the party is asking the Department of Justice to wait in. Help us understand the arguments they are making, the legal sort of argument for why state officials need to wade into these sort of intra-party disputes. So they've cited a few different state statutes and essentially made make the argument that parties are supposed to provide bylaws that explain how they how they conduct their elections. They're supposed to follow those bylaws. If they don't follow those bylaws, then the the nominees they they propose are not valid. They weren't nominated through a legal process. And that that's something that the Secretary of State, who declined to uh, con really consider this this argument, um, the Secretary of State said no. They're hoping maybe the Attorney General will look at these same arguments and decide that maybe they should they should agree with Tyler Smith and, and Richard Burke. Yeah, and, and as I understand the mechanism here, basically the argument they are making is the Libertarians tried to hold this meeting of party members to nominate. Uh, some candidates, not enough folks showed up. And so what happened mm -hmm. is the executive board of the party or the board of directors, I think they call it, just met and nominated their own folks. I think the argument that's being made is that is wildly out of step with what the bylaws would allow. It's an illegal process. And, and therefore, because these nominations are happening via an illegal process, the secretary of state needs to wade in. But, but as you mentioned, you know, the GOP has tried before to make arguments about bylaws and who's correct and who's not and haven't been successful. Is there any special reason you're hearing that they think this time will be different, that there's some something meaningfully potent about the current case that the Secretary of State or, or AG might agree with? Yeah, so this goes back to some of the internal party disputes that libertarians themselves were having in, in court filings over the past decade about the validity of their bylaws. And there is a ruling in about 2018 from the Oregon Court of Appeals that essentially told the, the group that hasn't succeeded that they were not that their argument was wrong, but that they were going about this the wrong way, that instead of going through the court system, they should file a complaint with the Secretary of State's office and then go through a separate administrative appeals process, not go straight to litigation, but go to an administrative law judge. 
And so that's something that Richard Burke um, is interested in doing. One of the things that really stands in the way of this, this current effort to get libertarians off the ballot in ahead of this election, though, is that timing is not on on the opponent's sides here. We've got just about two weeks until the first ballots are printed and mailed out to military and overseas voters, mm. a little more than a month before everyone else gets ballots. And that's not much time for um, for judges or the attorney general or anyone else to go through all of this information and make a decision. We have talked a lot about what the GOP thinks and says and argues. What do you hear from the Libertarian Party about these attempts to get their folks off the ballot? I'd say most libertarians I've heard from are furious about these efforts. They think that Republicans are acting entitled to their votes instead of working to earn their support. Uh, Matt Rao, the, the party chair I talked about earlier, responded to this complaint by telling party members that voting for, donating to, or volunteering for any Republican nominee would be, and, and I quote, rewarding a political act of aggression unprecedented in our state's modern political history mm. and a devious effort to disenfranchise <laughs> libertarian voters. But on the other hand, you've got one of the state's most prominent libertarians in Richard Burke. He's a former party chair, former nominee, now a member of the Oregon Government Ethics Commission, who's out here really working with Republicans and trying to argue that libertarians broke the rules. So th this now goes before the State Department of Justice, as we've said. I, I think one thing we should note here is that the DOJ also often gives legal counsel to the Secretary of State, meaning it's, it's very possible that when the Secretary of State made the decision, it wasn't going to wade into this fight. Um, they had the DOJ giving them sort of legal backup saying that's the correct call. So it doesn't seem that likely, and obviously I don't know, but it doesn't seem all that likely to me that they are going to agree with the Republicans here and Richard Burke. Um, but what do we know about the process? Like you mentioned that time is running short. What happens mm -hmm. from here? So a spokesman for the attorney general's office hasn't responded to my inquiries. Um, what we do know under state law is that election complaints are supposed to be immediately investigated. But you and I both know that the state has a backlog of elections complaints and investigations take time. And time is really running out in this case. Um, I don't I would imagine that libertarians will probably be on the ballot may or may not be blamed for the outcomes in some of these close races. But I'm also open to being surprised because I've been surprised with every other aspect of this story so far. If there's one thing we know, it is that election season is for surprises. Juliet, thank you so much for coming on the podcast and walking us through this today. Thank you for having me. This episode of OPB Politics Now was produced by Andrew Thien with audio engineering from Naleen Silva. Our music comes from Audio Network. We'll be back next week with more political news from across the Pacific Northwest. Until then, you can find all of OPB's reporting and become a member at opb.org. You can also find some of Julia's coverage of this tiff between the GOP and Libertarian Party there or at OregonCapitalChronicle.com. If you got time, it would be great if you'd rate and review us in your podcast app of choice. Thanks for your support and thanks for listening. Oh,